So I'm going to be reading a little bit about um, a book that I've been writing. Um, it's kind of excerpts from the book um, and it's a bit of experimental non-fiction so it will be flitting between different places and different times and I'm going to be reading it in a um, yeah, non-chronological way. Um, I think I'll probably wait a few more minutes to see if anyone else joins. But thanks Lola for uh, inviting me to do this, it's really nice. I met Lola, Lola works for the Stitching Artist book, who invited and who's this foundation it is. And I met Lola um, when doing another live reading for, um, for Home Screen, which is also a really, really worthwhile little project to check out. And they've been kind of showcasing, giving artists and writers and lots of people a platform to present um, while yeah, while, while this COVID-19 thing has been going on, so that's quite nice. Okay, so I reckon I'm just going to start and um, then more people may or may not join and that's fine. Um, the, the kind of the project is more or less about a big flood that happened in 1953 um, but it actually has grown into something a little bit more and it's me writing about uh, the idea of home, about poetry and truth and history and the landscape and geography and all sorts of different things so if it feels like there's a lot in this it's probably because it is um, but you know, that's, that's, that's just how it's going, so I'm quite looking forward to it. My desire to write about my home, Southend-on-Sea, has grown with the knowledge that to effectively do so requires a type of understanding of the place itself, rather than of my place in it. In September 2018, a year and six months after I had moved to Amsterdam, I made the following observation. The Essex Solitary, as defined by Tim Burroughs in his opening chapters of the publication Radical Essex, which is this book here, and it's really, really good, I recommend it, is the reason I'm yet to write a poem that works on South End and its surrounding landscapes. Language feels stifled and outside of things whenever I try. What I've come to realise is that the language I was using to translate my often overwhelming feelings about home at the expansive, leaking, historic mouth of the Thames was too obvious. Maybe it still is. But my move to the Netherlands stirred in me something that was not obvious at all. Through attempting to settle somewhat in a new country, I've become better equipped, practically and emotionally, to comprehend my position between the two places. I think this is to do with their aligned landscapes, geographically close to one another. You have Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk sharing the shallow North Sea Basin with the west of the Netherlands. Indeed, the two were once connected by the ancient land mass known as Doggerland. The 1953 flood is an event that has effect deeply affected both the national consciousness particularly in the Netherlands, and the local consciousness, particularly in the UK, on Canby Island, for example. There is so much to say about the two countries, their shared colonial histories of colonisation and migration on a wider scale, and of bordered wetlands. There are issues with how water is dealt with, how it is drained and displaced to striate and monetise land. Those who perished in the flood of 1953 particularly in those in the areas in the UK that were most affected, I'm talking about Jaywick, Harwich and Canby Island, were from a lower economic position, living in poorly made houses after an unfair allocation of resources following the Second World War. It's as the old aphorism goes, the rich live on the hill and the poor by the ever rising water. So I think we've got a couple more people who have joined. Um, just so you know what I'm doing, what I'm going to be reading, um, I'm going to be reading parts and excerpts from a from an experiment, experimental non-fiction book that I'm working on 
um, and it's more or less about a flood that happened in 1953 um, that devastated both the east coast of the UK and areas of the Netherlands as well um, and it's sort of about their shared their shared memory and the landscape that's shared between them. South End. The estuary is filling up like a bathtub. Water discharges and displaces into the surrounding land. How is the Thames estuary perceived by those who live and work along its foreshores, sandbanks and sea walls? When the sky is bright, and you look out towards the Isle of Grain or Sheppey, or to the familiar enveloping, enveloping grey, do you feel as if you're standing on a line or on an edge? I've been trying to unthink the Essex coastline in the interest of erasure. To undefine a landscape so familiar to oneself is not an easy thing to do. But to be able to consider the Essex estuaries this multitude of islands, creeks and rivers that braid and leak into each other, and of the life that has flourished and been taken by it, it is a necessary task. The materiality of water and its effect on land is what makes it a radical substance. Its constant movement demands a dynamic reaction of us. Lindsay Bremner's practice of unthinking coastlines allows us to see beyond demarc demarcated and striated land and into a flowing zone. This is necessary for understanding how people live and move through these zones. Armies, armadas, bodies, alive, dead, women, men, children, convicts, windsurfers, kite surfers, swimmers, day trippers, tourists, fishermen, the lost, the found, the saved, the murdered, container ships, cargo, Dutch barges, Thames barges, trawlers, prefabs, pleasure boats, caravans, warships, whales, fish, crab, mussels, jellyfish, worms, seaweed, algae, birds, wild fowl, sea mews, Royston crows, wild ducks, herons, swans, curlew, dunlin, brent geese, goods, Waste, tampons, sanitary towels, cocaine, plastics, ceramics, bombs, unexploded, exploded. Weather, wind, water, sand, mud, sun, rain, fog and storm. Fluids and floods that flow and spill and run out, splash, pour over, leak, flood, spray, drip, seep and ooze. Our intimacies with water are always decided by the water and the landscape by which we associate ourselves with. Sometimes we might think that we have shaped the water, but it's the water that's given us shape. If we see water as a radical material substance, we realise that it represents both the substantive, our social, political, cultural heritages, and the representational, the fluidity of our dreams, memories, perceptions and meanings. The concept of a memory landscape incorporates the collective knowledge associated with the idea of landscape from this perspective. It gives clarity to the understanding of a coastal landscape that's completely defined by water. The historian Norbert Fischer writes how regionally specific experiences of maritime death and grief materialised and perceived. Memories are sedimented into the landscape. This process depends on our experiences and changing reactions and how we deal with the threatening sea, which are built upon by our different social needs. He writes, under these conditions, the coastal landscape has been repeatedly reconfigured through the interaction of culture, mentality and society. It's this interaction and the internet interconnectivity of our existence under the perpetually changing conditions and structure of the sea, that our landscape and the landscape of the book I'm writing takes place. Landscape and the study of it is ambiguous and it's flowable and it's like the zones that the people of different landscapes have inhabited and moved through. We have to, in order to study landscape, we have to recognise that there's no fixed definition. It's this unbounded approach of accessing two particular landscapes, 
and the relationship between them that I'm interested in them. Holland, the province in which Amsterdam belongs. Beyond the black grounds, the areas of sand and silt are to be found running in broad strips parallel with the shoreline of the islands. Between the areas of sand and silt may be found the low ridges of sand and shell. These alternating areas of bands of sand and silt and sand and shell occur until this channel known as the West Swin is reached. The term Swin means to the islanders a large channel in which there is water at any state of the tide. The word Swin derives from the Old English meaning a creek or a channel. It was published as Swin in 1365 and the same word Swin occurs in Dutch I'm flying over a flat veil of cloud between the Netherlands and England. I'm looking over Doggerland at dusk. A wet and undulating land with dark pockets that you would fall right through if you stepped short. All blue and all green. I know that the lights of boats shining beneath are from another world altogether. A future one where the swell of the North Sea would go on to shape and keep reshaping so much of what is important. The land is built of black sand and shell and sand and silt and shell and silt and probably poor dogs scouring low areas for silt. If I were to fall through its sandy holes, I would land with a splash into the North Sea rising, faster than anyone could have ever imagined. And would my motion be enough to alter the current state of its watery disposition, and if not mine, then some others perhaps, or some other thing, all blue and all green. Uh, I moved to Amsterdam in March 2017, and for quite a long, continuous time, I felt homesick in a very unspecific way. I didn't miss a certain food or a particular smell, I couldn't satiate my feeling of loss by calling with family or listening to British radio. And though it's true that moving to another country where you don't know anyone or speak the language is an isolating experience, for me, more than anything, I felt physically out of place. This feeling was somewhat mollified once I travelled out of the city and visited places like the Sister Downen in the province of Utrecht, an expanse of man-made sand dunes and forest or travelling by train through the flatlands to the north. And it was once I travelled to Friesland, a province in the north of the Netherlands, when I felt the homesickness abate. The landscape was really similar to what I considered as home. In Zwarte Ham, one of the villages looking toward the Wadden island of Tuscheling in Ameland, a signboard at the bottom of a dune leading up to the water described the place, Black Swan, as the start of the world. It echoed a description of South End that I'd seen before, again in the same essay by Tim Burrows, who also grew up in South End, and he writes how during his youth, quote, South End seemed at the, at the edge of nowhere, the end of the line, but here, he writes, it could have been a twinkling beginning. This not knowing if a landscape signals the start or the end, the deliberate unthinking of a coastline, the thinking that water and a landscape approximate nothing, are all valuable perspectives when you engage with landscape. Perspectives on landscape are inherently ambiguous and they pop up anywhere, often in an unpredictable manner. Foulness Island. Silt, mud, peat. Silt, mud, Peat. Silt, modder, peat. Slip, modder, fame. Silt, modder, peat. Slip, mud, fame. Soil strata for Great Burwood. The topsoil is a natural build up, mainly early 20th century finds were recovered from this level. Level 1. The soil at this level appears to have been brought to the site to level the area prior to the 17th century building construction. It would seem most likely from the makeup of this strata level 
but the soil comes at a time when the local pond was being constructed. The finds at this level are mainly from the late 17th century. However, we do find in certain areas of the site earlier and later finds. This, we believe, is due to disturbance from the modern 20th century rubbish pits, which were dug after the original Great Burwood was demolished. Level 11. This is what is known as natural. For this area, that means a sandy type of soil, lightish brown in colour, the 14th century occupation is found at this level. 40 square miles of the Lower Thames marshes are the natural floodplains of the Thames. The word floodplain must be interpreted literally, for while embanking restricts the lateral development of a tide, it increases the heights of tides, including, of course, the highest tide. They, these will inevitably spill over into parts of the floodplain. On Falness Island, at the end of one end of the ancient Broomway path, just beyond the seawall, you will find the grassy foundations of a bungalow, visible not from its bricks and concrete, but from the high weeds of flower and flowers tangling over what would have been the windows and roof of Mrs Rawlings' home, growing from her garden. Mrs Rawlings was one of the two women to have died on Falness from the Great Flood of 1953. Both were widows and both were called Mrs Rawlings. Bertha Rawlings and Violet Rawlings swept. The mystery was not that it had been snowing, but that the snow was of the same composition and of the same temperature as the water. Looking outside your window to see sweeping water is not the same as seeing a fresh covering of snow. All farmhouses are lonely. In the basement they found a family waiting for the end, in a farmhouse in Drenth, just as on Falness, waiting for the news of someone's death. On Saturday night, the 31st of January and Sunday morning, the 1st of February 1953, a great flood devastated Scotland, England, Belgium and the Netherlands. It killed over 2,550 people. Scotland, 19. Belgium, 28. England, 307. North Sea, 361. The Netherlands, 1,836. And that doesn't include the animals and the unidentified and the unaccounted for. Floods have recurrently torn apart the islands, inlets and creeks around the Essex estuary. The land here is unconsolidated and continually in movement. October 20th, 1570, unprecedented. December 1690, unprecedented. September 28th, 1764, unprecedented. January the 2nd, unprecedented. January the 14th, 1808, October 18th. 1841, March 18th, 1874, unprecedented, January the 1st, 1877, unprecedented, November 29th, 1897, unprecedented, December 1921, February 1943, unprecedented, January the 31st, 1953, unprecedented. Canby Island. The little isles of Candy and Falness on the coast of Essex were quite underwater. Not a hoof was saved thereon, and the inhabitants were taken from the upper parts of their houses into boats. A low level world made and remade. When you look at a map and point in, which, point in the direction which the North Sea, Basin narrow, North sea Basin narrows, you'll see the markings of an island called Canby. Take your finger and trace it across the water and you'll disembark roughly at Middelburg in the Zeeland province in the Netherlands. This is significant to the many floods in two places have had to endure together over history. How much do lines tell us? Do flood lines, those marked on walls to indicate the ghost of a watery disaster, make us more aware of the memory, history and commemoration of a place? Or are they too fixed? 
providing only a static reminder of an event so dynamic. Norbert Fischer describes flood marks as narratives of a very specific regional history. These are symbolic sites of maritime death, and through such sites, the history of the coast is inscribed into the landscape. Canvey Island is in a constant state of renegotiation with water, marshland and its people, as with all the islands of Essex. For this reason, any investment in marsh, bog, soggy land and waterscapes in all senses, naturally, emotionally and financially, can never have the outcome so desired by those, humans or otherwise, who alter its state. Canvey's history of reclamation redevelopment and rewilding stretches from the 16th century through to the 21st century and it makes it a composite island. The land rises and falls making it fertile for storytelling and welcoming different people and is open to multiple interpretations and meanings. On a biological level though we can never truly rewild a landscape as in return it to its pre-human condition Recreating healthy environments with natural food, light, clear air and clean water is beneficial to humans and other animals. And the Canvey Wick Nature Reserve, once Doggerland, sea, river estuary, to salt marsh, to oil refinery, constructed, constructed only partially but never used, returned in the 1980s onwards to a site of ultra-rich biodiversity. But how radical is the practice of rewilding landscapes? If rewilding is the process by which human alters landscape to return to its natural state, though it's often for environmental values and to transform its properties into capital, supposedly for social values, and the restoration of landscapes for all its apparent redemption often, often happens at the very expense of the environment it's operating to enhance or exploit or save. For that is what rewilding is, an operation is operating in a continuous narrative. The develop developer Frederick Hester, his vision to turn Canby into a booming resort for jaded Londoners, that never materialised. In an article from the Nottingham Evening Post in 1903, advertising Canby Island's grand designs, presumably placed by Hester, it's written that Canby Island, properly speaking, cannot be described as a seaside or a riverside resort inasmuch as it, is, as it is a singular and agreeable admixture of both. So, can be composite land below sea level. Had it not been drained, and had nature been allowed to follow its course, the island would be underwater. And in this sense, it can be considered a contradiction. Dockham. The Netherlands as it is now has taken its formation since the end of the last ice age, 11,700 years ago. And aside from changes in its four main natural processes, relative sea level rise, the tide and waves, river dynamics and peak formation, it's humans who have contributed to the largest changes in the landscape. And the first major changes came from the increase in population and infrastructure from the Roman period, when the native population who had begun to cultivate naturally draining peatlands, caused peat to oxidise, compact and flood. Research has shown that in Friesland and especially Zeeland, the decom decomposition of the peatlands through human intervention was so extensive that the sea was able to create openings in the coast and to gain a hold on the hinterland. Consequently, at high tide and during storm surges, large areas were lost in a very short time and unwittingly, people had caused, caused major damage to the landscape. Time passed and landscape and society had returned to an earlier state. The exploitation of peatlands continued once again as more land was colonised to support new demographic growth when the area of the present day Netherlands joined the Carolingian Empire. And the hydrological issues that came with reclaiming peatland were this time overcome with technology such as the famous Dutch windmills, an early 15th century design which travelled across the North Sea so that soon these windmills would be emerging out of a waterlogged Essex landscape too. But the raised, embankments formed, the raised embankments formed by the windmills that drained water from the polders when the levels were high created a new problem, 
They prevented seawater from flowing freely across the land during floods and surges. The colonisation of land in the Netherlands and the power that humans wielded during times of animal wind and later fossil fuel power has proven to be a double-edged sword. It has allowed the Dutch people to shape their country, sustain themselves from the sea, but at the expense of everything that they have tried to create and protect. The Netherlands and homesickness belong to one another. Landscapes, as Christopher Tilly and Kate Cameron Down suggest, are inexhaustible and unbounded, rhizomic rather than rooted. This is my experience. Being homesick or having the affliction of homesickness is to be unrooted, to be neither here nor there. I move to a country where the landscape might be deemed as unrooted. Is it the unknowing of how the land lies in relation to water? The constant shift of land that is taken and then taken back? Or is it actually a full sense of stability, of control, the victory of humans to put land under our own feet? False, because we don't know how long it will stay there. History, especially local history, is defining despite being hard to define. Hundreds, even thousands of years can feel like ancient history to most, though of course the age of humanity is nothing in comparison to the age of the earth. Each pair of hands, soft soles of trainers, stubbed out cigarettes, carved names and dates that have left a mark on the ruins of Hadley Castle are what bind humans to history. Charlie Gear writes, perhaps every landscape can be seen as inscribed by the endless passionate and violent processes through which it bears witness to what it has endured. Whether meteorological, geological, biological or human, but it is the human inscription that binds such a landscape to language and thus to history and the human. The eighth century Christian martyr Saint Boniface was an Anglo-Saxon missionary born as Winfred into a noble Wessex family Consecrated as a missionary bishop and renamed Boniface by Pope Gregory II in Rome, his mission was to spread Christianity in the pagan Frankish kingdom. Boniface was killed by pagan Frisians as he was preaching on the 5th of June in 1754 in Dockham, the provincial hometown of a band called the Homesick. In a review of Youth Hunt, St Boniface, the song, is described as a compelling testimony to the homesick's heritage. Several monuments in the largely Christian town of Dockham are named after St Boniface. Historical monuments like St Boniface in Dockham, and indeed the monument of the saint in the form of the song written and performed by the homesick, are manifestations of a memory landscape. My favourite song from the album, this song, St Boniface, serves a sensation of clambering over castle ruins, weather-beaten and asturial, and it therefore constitutes a part of my local memory landscape. All through the summer, dog walkers, teenagers, families walk to Hadley Castle as a sort of local ritual, the ruins of which, and they really are ruins, are heralded as ancient markers that stand stoically as an indication of our collective past and heritage. When people visit the ruins and set down their picnic baskets or sit down to sketch them or crack open their cans of warming beer and take photos of the ruins with one another, where do they situate themselves? Is it within the history of the place or is it within the local identity? Of course, most people out enjoying a day at Hadley Castle probably don't think of any of these things, but certainly there is a strong sense of regional identity in Southend and a visit to the ruins remains to be one of the activities considered as a rite of passage if you live nearby. The formation of this memory landscape or a maritime memory landscape, according to Norbert Fischer, actually begins most, mostly after the mid 19th century because it's a period of social upheaval and identity. The expansion of seaside resorts demanded self-assurance of identity within coastal and island communities, but the loss of political autonomy as tourism and state influence grew, fueled 
the fear of a loss of identity. South End and places like Canby Island also went on, underwent this crisis after being developed in the 19th century as seaside resorts and experiencing a sharp decline in the 1960s onwards. This fluctuation of identity, along with its proximity to and permeable relationship with East London, historically one of the poorest areas of the capital, are distinctive element, the elements of the development of Essex. One of the main examples that constitute a maritime memory landscape for Fisher is that of flood marks and remembrance of storm surges and flooding. And these are found in loads of harbour towns and coastal resorts. They can be in the form of lines indicating the flood level against a wall, such as that in the fishing village of Old Lee or in the Foulness Island Heritage Centre. But I believe they can also be the less obvious markers found in flooded houses, hidden behind wallpaper or through damaged household items through the absence of lost photographs. Um, I was going to read some poems, but it looks like my printer didn't actually print them off in the end. Come to an abrupt end in my, um, in my sheets. Okay, what I'll do is grab my pamphlet and I'll read one more poem from there so we can uh, finish it off. Back in a sec. <laughs> I also realise it's like one of the hottest days of the summer this year. Um, and I'm here sitting talking about coastal, cold, blowy, flooded landscape. So I'm sorry about that. Or maybe it's a welcome relief because I'm so hot right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know where those, those poems have gone, but if you do want to read them in the future, then I guess you'll just have to wait for the book to be finished. Um, yeah, and hopefully it will get published as well. Um, I'm working with two great people who run Dunlin Press in a place called Wivenhoe in Essex. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to, I think they're also looking forward for me to like finish this and send it to them. So if you, uh, if you want to read more poems and more stuff in a more coherent manner, then uh, yeah, just, just watch out for that. Um, I'll finish with one poem that was published uh, in my poetry pamphlet, which was published in November last year. Um, by Broken Sleep Books. Um, it's called Two Tree Island. The Thames supports the fifth largest total of wintering waterfowl of any estuary in the United Kingdom. Lugworms, rags of worms and mollusk-like cockles and razors, those moon-faced shrimp-like shells and curlew and dunlin and bar-tailed godwit. There are slippery sea martians, sea sponges and sea squirts sea anemones and cucumbers that squirt sea, and a dozen different kind of crab that congregates in sheltered zones, around the supports of South End Pier, or under pebbles and amongst the mussel beds. Beds of eelgrass are on the mudflats of Two Tree Island. This rare underwater flowering plant is the favourite food of the dark-bellied Brent geese that winter in the Essex estuary before returning to the tundra of Arctic Russia. So, thanks for joining. Um, and watch out for all of the other ones that are coming up on the uh, Sticking Artist Book uh, Instagram. And I believe that they will be uploaded to YouTube as well. So, um, and you can watch the, the previous ones on their Instagram TV and they're well worth, worth, well worth a watch. And there are a lot more kind of, um, performative than mine. I'm not really a performer, but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, okay, I need to end this. Have a nice evening.